Uh, thank you and welcome to those online listening to submissions. We've had some submissions this morning in Thai Happy. Um, the travel between Thai Happy and Martin has taken just a fraction longer for us than we envisaged. We apologise for the delay. Um, we welcome to table a uh, submission from Richard White, submission number 401, page 20. Richard, you understand that the rules of timing are you have 10 minutes, including question time, okay. and how you use that time is up to you. Thank you. Your time starts now. Well, thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you, councillors, for listening to my submission. I, I do want to encourage questions, so um, I shall keep an eye on the time and uh, call myself to help give you time to ask questions, um, but I am here to... Um, speak to my submission on the, the streetscape upgrade. I'd like to say, first of all, I applaud the council on the leadership you've shown here by ticking the brick box. Um, but to those councillors that may be questioning um, the validity of, of that, I, would, I probably would be speaking to you. Um, the reason in my submission I put um, the, my background and my connection to Martin is because some of you may ask, what is a Wanganui resident showing so much interest in, in Martin for? Um, and I do have strong family roots here, but I work here as well. And, um, and it's that business of real estate um, um, that has put me in, in touch with what I call the, the heart of, of um, the streetscape area. Um, but in my own right, I'm, I'm also a property owner um, in Wanganui. Um, so I've got um, a direct personal link to the wants and needs of my tenants and my businesses. Um, I run the motto that the success of any investment is the success of my tenants' businesses. And I want to see that happen for Martin as well. But talking to the businesses through my real estate work and, and the other uh, connections in, in town, they said they want something to be proud of and an environment that will attract customers to the town to shop. Um, and I mentioned in my submission a number of sales of properties um, that I've been associated with to emphasise the huge exposure um, that the town gets through real estate. That's just through me. We're, we're also obviously uh, through residential connections as well and, and other forms, rural and lifestyle. Of these properties that I mentioned, 172 parties visited these properties, and that's not just individuals. There would have been other people with them as well. And the feedback from them was unfortunately sometimes quite brutal, and these are the properties that are just on the main street that I'm talking about, not others in, in the wider the wider sector of the town. Yet they were sometimes br brutal. They were always honest um, and often complimentary. Um, our streetscape is our shop window for these people coming from out of the region into our area. The, um, the compliments invariably were about the character of our buildings and the boutique size and nature of our town. We are attractive to out of, out of region buyers because our prices bring them here. It's one of the, one of the uh, big factors. Um, but you, you can buy a newly built house here for significantly less than other areas. You know, like Auckland, you, uh, you know, half, half the price. So we need to have something else to make them want to stay here. And if we jazz our, our town up, um, demand will lift and that will help property values as well. And up go the rates. <laughs> My connection in Wanganui, I wanted to talk about that because I've been directly involved with a project in Wanganui, which is uh, not dissimilar to the one that's um, proposed here. The Guyton Street Initiative, it's a $1.2 million project in collaboration with Waka Katahi and the Wanganui District Council. And they've come up with a groundbreaking idea of, um, in the two blocks of Guyton Street, of installing a roundabout and raised crossings. Well, hallelujah, Martin's already got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the other, the, that sort of highlights um, um, the point. There's already the framework here. We've got the character buildings, we've got the raised crossings, we've got the roundabouts, we just need to dress it up and, and get it tidied up. The leadership from the council is critical. There's more than just the streetscape involved here for property owners. 
there's the, the earthquake prone buildings, the 78 earthquake prone buildings in the town that will need investment from property owners. They need to want to invest into their buildings and the streetscape beautification will be the catalyst for that, I feel, and will we'll, um, <coughs> help kick it off. There has been negative feedback to that um, project to Wanganui, but it's soon been kicked into touch. Um, criticism like um, um, the police and the fire engines won't be able to go down the street. Well, we spoke to them beforehand and they said, we'll just go down another street. It's easily sorted out. The frameworks here, as I say, um, to be honest, all it needs is a paint to get it going. It's not expensive, but beautify it. There's already um, in place, on, and it's available on the website, the, uh, the plan that the council commissioned back in 2014. I think that's a fantastic start. And instead of spending 100000 on recommissioning, just go and rejig that and bring it to the table again and use part of that $100,000 that you're going to invest in the um, investigative stage to kickstart the program off. You know, we've got leadership in town. John Hill with the post office has already started painting and he's done the Ballantyne's building as well. He's got the ton, tongues wagging. Um, part of the jigsaw puzzle's in place almost, like countdown, a tidy, property brokers building is tidy and you could probably talk to the right people there to get it jazzed up a bit more. <laughs> Tomato how hard's building is tidy. So it's a jigsaw that just needs filling in. And um, if you sit back and look at it, it's, uh, I don't think it's as big a scheme as, as um, it, could be, it could turn out to be. Um, look, I, I just might summarize now because I do want to encourage questions. Um, just the council leadership, I think, in this is critical. Uh, revitalising our town will not be done by individuals. It needs the council to start the leadership and bring the individuals into play through their involvement, through their leadership. We've got these challenges in place that are bigger than just the streetscape, but we've got to make a start. This earthquake striking is, is a major one here as well. Um, it's a, a significant journey for Martin. Um, and it's just this, I feel, will be a re-emergence for the town. Uh, we're the hub of the Rangitiki, and this is the capital of our region, and we need to look like it. We need to look the part. It'll be a great reward for our ratepayers and something really tangible, not only for the locals, but also for the visitors coming to, our, to experience our, our town and our region. As I said at the beginning, this is our shop window, so let's tidy it up and tell the right story. So um, I ask, yeah, any questions? Um, question Councillor Loudon, then myself, Councillor Loudon. Two questions, if that's all right. Um, See how we go for time yeah. in terms of multiple questions. What you, Richard, thank you. What, what do you mean by revitalising and refreshing the town centre? What do you actually expect in, in that comment? Well, look, I'm, I'm a real fan of, I think paint is very underrated. I think the result from painting things is, is the best return on investment. As soon as you get into capital um, <coughs> uh, uh, outlay, the, it gets big dollars very quickly, and that can that can stall any project. But you only have to see what um, paint has done to the various buildings that have already been done, how how it can lift them. It doesn't hold the boards together, but it gives a good feeling. And and I always I talk about paint and cranes are a good um, indicator as to uh, progress, and but it gets tongues wagging in a positive form. And um, mm. as soon as the cranes went up down the Ohak here, the positivity around that was, was incredible. <laughs> so, so it's that sort of thing I'm talking about. Just hold your second question. I'm just aware you've only got a couple of minutes left. I yeah. need to allow time for others. A question from me, when you talk about paint and recognising individual buildings, do you see that the, the <laughs> actual money being spent on private property? Look, I, I think um, discussion will, will open that up um, as, as to whether it does. Um, it's probably a, a, a council might be uh, keen on just spending money on paint and not bricks and mortar, perhaps. Council have already shown leadership. The polls that you did, the strengthening um, on the veranda on your own buildings down there by painting them. The criticism before you painted them was, God, they're not even going to paint them. You painted them and look at the difference mm. it made. So we've only a minute left. Any questions other than Councillor Loudon's second question? 
No, I go to Councillor Loudon. Um, in regards to Wanganui and the uh, streets of people um, changes there, how significant is the Wanganui Heritage uh, Grant scheme in seating these the streetscape pro projects? Uh, the the money has come from Wakaka Tai predominantly, and the district council made up the difference. So there's just the two financial inputs coming from that in that respect. Anything outside that, Heritage have um, put their hand up and, and are open for application for that sort of thing. But that's where the key funding has come from. Well, um, thank you very much, Richard, for your submission. Um, once we get through deliberation stage, we'll come back to you, but I appreciate the work that you're doing in terms of the, the community as well. Thank you for that. You Coming you. back. I'll be back. Any more questions? Thank you. I'll move on, please, to submission 303. Uh, Joe Ranguni. Joe, if you'd like to come to the table. You're well known to us, so I presume this is a submission from you personally. Yes. Thank you. I just hope to plunge, but I'm still coming back. <laughs> Good to see you, Joe. Uh, thank you to councillors for working to ensure that the Rangataka infrastructure is looked at and you're aware of it and that I'm sure you're looking at secure water supplies as well as the economic development. It's a big job and I'm not sure quite big and heavy. And we're very fortunate when you work well all together and you can encourage our communities to work well together. Thank you to the staff who work very well around a lot of people. Um, and in our local neighbourhood, um, we're just so grateful that um, the grove across from us is well maintained and it's a very attractive area. Um, so thank you for that. Speaking to my submissions more directly, the swimming pool has costs, but I think they're well outweighed by the benefits. I think we've got to think of the whole community and everyone in our community. And if our young people are well occupied and active and the swim clubs and that sort of thing, I do think there's considerable um, benefits for us all. I'm wondering about really education, and I don't know how the council could do it, but you never know. If you don't say, someone may be able to think outside the square and think of something. But I'm wondering if there needs to be some education for some people to remove quite a few about reducing rubbish. Um, because I think we're more aware, well, hopefully, we a collective way are more aware of the impact we are having on our environment <coughs> and um, the importance to leave it to the next generations in good shape. So I just notice in our little area of town, there's enormous differences in the amount of rubbish going out. And I'm thinking, oh, what's going on? Um, <laughs> you know, how some people have two or three bags a week or a fortnight, and other people have almost none. Um, I know we put ours about every five weeks, but I think we're doing our things. But there are only two of us, so um, that makes a difference too. Revitalising Mark uh, Martin, I, I think change is very difficult to predict. So where will Martin be in 30 years? I mean, we looked at Bill years ago and the amount of things. We gathered quite a lot of data around traffic, which perhaps is more relevant. But we did work pretty hard on, um, and we spent quite a lot of money, but the whole thing was a bit tough on. But I'd certainly support Council doing something in Martin, I think it's important. But I always like it when the whole community is involved. You have the different stakeholders. I mean, you've heard one stakeholder, and I think it's very important to hear that stakeholder. But there are, you know, there's the traffic people, there's the walking people, there's the old people, there's the very young people, our children. Um, 
And it's sometimes you get pearls of wisdom from unexpected places. So that I do, I'm a great believer in inclusion and diversity. So I do think um, if there are ways that you can include different, and maybe get some data. Um, I think data is often quite expensive to get, but it can be quite productive. Um, and I, I wondered, um, yeah, That's about all I've really got to say. Are you happy to take questions? Yes. I am quite deep, actually. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and speak up. I've Thank got you. new hearing aids and the state of the art. But, um, it's, yeah, I think a lot of people don't admit to it. I admit to it. <laughs> um, but it helps me enormously if people speak clearly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll try and speak as clearly as I can. I, I, under I understand your situation. <laughs> um, and when you talk about the affordability of rates as part of your submission, and yet you are suggesting that we keep the pool open all year round, are you aware of the rates impact that would have? I read it. My brain doesn't hold on to specific information, but I still thought that it is one thing for the, I would have me have my rates rise a bit more to have an inclusive thing for all people and our school children are able to, I think swimming's a life skill. So I think there are things that we need to spend money on that um, maybe don't benefit us directly. And okay. there's old people getting there and there's people walking and people are hurt. Um, right, getting their strength back. So, um, I, again, maybe the data would help. I mean, if no one's using it, no one's going it, well, I think that answers itself. Mm -hmm. But maybe the data needs to say, um, you know, and the, the correct to say, well. Joe, I've, I have a question from Councillor Wilson. Councillor, uh, very quickly, Joe, do you use, use the swimming pool? Do you visit it? Is it something you... I used to, but I've sort of got, I've had it up, done, and I'm getting older, and, um, okay. and I'm finding it hard to make myself do things that I used to be quite easy to do. So I did use it for years, and okay. I loved it. It was wonderful. I went once a week, and it was really good for me. And that's why I'm sort of advocating it for our books, mm. because I'm sort of in my 80s. So I'm like, mm, it's getting harder. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for councillors? No, Joe. thank you very much for your submission. I'd like to listen to other people, if there's other people. Yes, yeah. I'll move to the submission, uh, um, David McMillan, uh, submission number 282. David, if you'd like to, when you can, thank you. David, do you understand the time constraints that we are required to operate under? And the time is yours. Thank you. Greetings, Your Worship and elected members. Thank you for allowing me opportunity to speak. Um, I was looking at um, the methodology of the um, curbside recycling that's going to be, looks, it looks like, rolled out in the next little while. Um, slide up there at the moment is the, the starting slide. And what I was trying to say there is that uh, we have a history with uh, curbside recycling in New Zealand. And uh, what was rolled out initially uh, 10, 20 years ago was the wheelie bins. Mm. and crates, crates through the glass bottles. Mm. And so that was the first approach. Um, things have changed quite a bit in the last 10, 20 odd years in regard to what is probably best practice these days. Uh, wheelie bins are great rubbish bins, but there's a question mark in my view about um, suitability for curbside recycling. So this was what I'd like to mention. And just a bit more background. Um, 
years ago when we started doing curbside recycling, uh, it was important to get quantity because essentially we could package all up the recycles that we get and send them off to Southeast Asia, in particular China. But that's no longer an option. And uh, the world doesn't want quantity, they want quality now. So this is how we perhaps will get quality. So the next slide, please. So here we have the three crate system. Now, it might be new to um, a lot of us, but this has been rolled out successfully in Hastings and in Napier. Um, and this is what they uh, put out there, but not only there, but our neighbours, Monganui, have also rolled out a three crate recy curbside recycling collection. So it's not unheard of. Uh, it's what um, a lot of councils are looking at. And what some benefits there is you can have, if you're a little bit more inclined to um, liquid refreshment, you can actually fill up two crates or maybe all three of them. <laughs> you're not, uh, but long as you keep the same things in each crate. So there is a bit of flexibility there. So people often complain that there's not enough um, capacity for all my bottles that I'd like to put out at curbside recycling. So that can be also factored in there with that arrangement. Um, you can also do a staged approach to curbside placement. You can have your curbside recycling, say, on a Monday, and then whatever doesn't get picked up on the Monday automatically goes into your rubbish. So nothing, nothing hangs around. So you can stage it. So recycling first, rubbish next day. And it picks up all the stuff that wouldn't be collected. Uh, next slide, please. There we have um, what we have rolled out basically nationwide, our neighbours, Palms and North, um, Manawatu Council. Um, there was an interesting question that I was privy to, uh, being in the solid waste business myself as a um, person involved in the solid waste industry. And the, per the manager from Hastings City Council asked, before they rolled out or decided what they were going to use at curbside, she asked, um, the Palmerston North City Council waste solid waste manager. And the question was, what would you do differently if you could? And the answer was quite clear. She said, we wouldn't roll out wheelie bins for curbside recycling. That's what she said. Mm -hmm. And that's what advice um, Hastings and Napier went with. They didn't roll out curbside wheelie bins. And so why is that? Well, you can imagine the wheelie bin there um, it's about to where my finger is, you can say that that would be all general rubbish that would go in there. So what, that's what we call contamination. So generally speaking, contamination can be up to 30%. And that's, just, that's what um, many councils are dealing with, is the high contamination rate. So what would that mean for the Rangitike if you rolled out these bins? Well, I worked it out at a third of the bin being contaminated, this is maximum figures, not minimum, there would be 209 tonnes per annum that would be contamination. That would go have to go straight to landfill. That's an additional charge on the service. That would be, using today's prices that you've got on your fees and charges, that would be another $43,000 per annum, net GST, that you'd have to pay on that service. But that doesn't stop there, because all, all what's in here will go to a sorting factory and they'll charge something like $160 a tonne to sort, maybe even more as time goes by, $200 a tonne, maybe next year to sort. So that's another, another charge of 33,000 per annum. So all, all up, about 76,000 per annum, extra cost to have this type of arrangement. And that could be somebody's wage mm -hmm. in the council. It's a fairly sort of average sort of uh, um, payment for having somebody in the council. So, Next slide, please. So there we are, the crate system. Now, I, I spoke to people in uh, Hastings and I said, what is your contamination rate for curbside crate systems? And funny enough, they said it was zero. So that's a huge saving. Uh, why is it zero? Because essentially, the difference between this arrangement is there is no lid. And with, without having a lid, it's harder to hide things. So when you've got a lid, everything you put in there more or less becomes invisible. So the truck comes along, grabs with his arm on the truck, 
grabs it up, flicks it over into the hopper, poof, it's all gone. There's no real control over it. Mm. And they're so busy anyway, they're very quick. Time is, is money, so they're mm. quickly going around the streets. But with a crate, how do you hide things? It's all there to be seen. So if they put stuff in there, it can quickly be stickered. You don't even pick it up. You just leave it there. That goes in the rubbish the next day. Um, I was going to mention what the world has got out there as well. Next slide, please. This is what is in Wales, uh, in the UK. Trolley box. It's a bit more um, complicated, but it has having quite good success in Wales. Again, it's a three-stack system. You've got three essential um, crates all stacked together with a wheelie bin frame to, to manoeuvre it out to the gate. Mm -hmm. um, it's, again, low contamination because they curbside sort it. You've got men going along or women going along and just opening up the, um, the, the bins and putting the cardboard in one uh, hopper, glass bottles in another hopper, and plastics in another hopper. So it's all sort of curbside sorted. So you've got very, very low contamination. So... But that's probably a little bit more expensive. But if we wanted to go that way, we would be in the Rangitike, would be leading the charge when it comes to what is the next mm -hmm. um, type of um, kit to use for curbside recycling. Um, so, yes, I welcome questions now, if you like. Um, thank you. I've got a question, Councillor Lambert. Yeah, um, just sorry. Myself, no, you just the contamination. So you're saying it's everything that's not recyclable. So it's dirty nappies, apple cores. It, people are using it like a bin. Yep. and then throws them behind. Okay. Yeah, you'd be surprised what gets thrown in there. Yeah, it's, I it's wouldn't be quite horrible. Yeah, <laughs> I'd imagine. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and the thing, just adding to that, if you don't have somebody in the council regularly doing compliance inspections, it just gets worse. Mm. And oh, okay. you can't sort of say, "I've done it this year; it's all done and dusted." You've got to do it every year, throughout the year, every year. It doesn't go away. As soon as you take the yeah, foot off the pedal, so to speak, uh, it just comes back again. So I presume that with the open bins, that, that staff picking them up, if they see contamination, they just move on. Yes, they just leave it there. Thank you. Councillor Dalgetty, followed by Councillor Rokawa. Councillor. Thank you. I loved your submission and learned a lot. Just um, interested if you're um, able to share what actually is your role in rubbish and um, yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about your expertise. Right. So I initially worked in the Rurupay District Council as the solid waste uh, officer there uh, for a little while and then I moved to Manotu and contracted it in the same position to Rangitike. I did that for eight and a half years. So before your um, incumbent um, solid waste uh, officer, I was the solid waste officer for the council here. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm working for Horofanua District Council as their solid waste manager. And we're right on time. I'll take the last question, Councillor O'Carroll. Mine is your question, um, do you know invest in the streetscape big vitalization for Martin? Why? Is there a reason why you said oh yes the option? Yes. Not to? Um I think I was looking at um I guess cost savings, and I think the cost should sit probably with the property owners rather than council. I think it's a good idea to to revamp it for sure, but I think the cost sits with the, um, the owners of the businesses. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your submission. As uh, Councillor Dalgetty has said, very enlightening. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Move to the next submission. Um, Justin. Justin, and the same rules apply, and I presume the presentations from you personally. Yeah, it's, well, it's yep. yours. Thank you. Uh, your worship, councillors, uh, <clears throat> I'll take my written submission as read, uh, but I just need to clarify that under the policies and financial statements, it states I'm an accountant with 100 years' experience. Obviously, I'm not. Uh, I was just doing some experimenting with AI at the time and <laughs> cutting and pasting a few things. So I apologise for that. Since moving to this district eight months ago, uh, I faced an effective 50% increase in my rates. A revaluation in the first three increased my rates by 36%. This long-term plan increases it by 
approximately another 11.4, which is most likely higher. Effectively, my welcome to this district was a 50% rate and was crease. Um, you acknowledge that you need population growth and economic growth. Well, I think my circumstance shows at least one reason why you may be having trouble achieving that. <clears throat> it's a long-term plan. Advocating for Hunnival, I'd like to propose a Hunnival targeted rate of $4 or $1 a quarter being ring-fenced and documented that it is for the sole use and administered at the discretion of the Hunnival Community Committee. This will provide them with a substantial increase in budget, which will allow the committee to extend their much-needed work. As a sign of goodwill, I am prepared to cover the first year's costs if necessary. Uh, okay, key choices. Uh, as for key choice one, the poll, unequivocally option one. However, the information provided brings into question the rate of subsidy being provided currently because the proposed subsidised rate means that at full capacity in winter, ratepayers may end up subsidising the pool at $15 per person plus the $4 charge, which equates to $19 per person at its lowest. On face value to me, it appears an investigation needs to take place on if ratepayers are excessively subsidising the pool operations. Uh, key choice two being the recycling. Uh, that's option one. There's no contest. I've analysed this several times in the past. It just kills multiple birds with one stone, economic efficiency, health and safety, you name it. All right, key choice number three, the Martin Main Street. Using your own stated goal, my experience in moving here, uh, there are other much larger issues holding economic growth back. As someone who has 30 years experience in the tourism industry, running and working in multi-award winning five-star organisations, ranging from family businesses and multinationals, I think I have some experience in the matter of bringing people into an area for an economic benefit. After reading this option, I made it a point to drive the section of Main Street multiple times and observe. I've done this multiple times, and to me, apart from getting some council workers out there with a water blaster, refreshing some of the gardens, there's no physical work council staff need to do in this area. Most of the appearance issues lie at the hands of the shop building owners. I don't believe it is necessary to spend $2 million on something which is simple bylaw requiring Main Street or CBD building owners to upkeep their properties, street frontage, would uh, easily resolve with little to no expenditure or burden placed on rate payers. I propose a better alternative would be to significantly uh, spend less on an economic growth plan for the entire district. It will produce significantly larger results for less expenditure during a cost of living crisis. The written submission contains a brief example of an economic growth plan that council can facilitate. And I'm happy to take any questions you have. Questions for council. Councillor so Picky to or do you have a question? Um, yes, <laughs> thank you. Yes. And thank you for your submission. It's really wide ranging. Um, and, and a number of the, um, you've got a number of oh. ideas and yep. choices um, through this um, in the agricultural innovation all yep. the way through. Yep. Do you feel that um, a lot of these things, uh, in particular, are council's responsibility? Uh, I think, whilst not council responsibility, council has the ability to facilitate or uh, manipulate's not the word I'm looking for, but mm -hmm. sort of guide a path towards it, at least. Um, a lot of the things you guys will be, and I know this, will be getting uh, accused of have got nothing to do with you. But there are things you can push in certain directions to get moving. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, just one question from me. Um, do you question the way that councils, and it is common to councils, in terms of what you refer to as the perpetual debt theory? In other words, not paying off a loan in instalments in terms of your accrued. But I would have thought that was in odds with your feelings about the intergenerational um, effect of debt. And by going through the processes that council use in terms of debt repayment, 
it effectively spreads a loan from one generation to another. Uh, sure. Now, I'm just not seeing the inter link. Intergenerational debt's an interesting topic because this has only come up in the modern term. Uh, modern history, so to speak. Um, and the problem with the spread <laughs> debt and the spreading it across generations is that the odds of that debt being paid or paid off significantly reduce each time. Um, there's examples in Britain even of councils who owe billions of pounds and they've got no chance of paying it. Small councils like this one. Um, I just feel that extending debt for significantly longer periods of time simply guarantees rates increases in perpetuity. You can't guarantee an inflation, right? I mean, some of you will remember when you paid 20% in the 80s. It happens. Just because right now it's not, that's fine. But perpetual debt opens you up to... Not I'm saying you are specifically doing perpetual debt, but it's leaning that way. It's a, I think the wording is open term bond. Okay, I'd take the conversation further, but I'd yeah. move Councillor Duncan followed by Councillor Loud and Councillors. Councillor Loud. Oh, thank you, Ms Adams, and thank you. This is amazing um, work that you've put into this. Um, in your submission, uh, so I've heard you say that you feel... Um, the um, upgrade of the main street is not something you support. <laughs> However, you do say that public art and green spaces uh, beautify the community with public art installations and well mm -hmm. maintain green spaces. So, so that would be, is that what you're saying instead uh, of what's proposed or? Partially, I think that everyone sort of comes and expect council to do everything. Mm -hmm. Council can't do everything. Because um, the same people will say complain that you're spending their money to do X, Y, Z, which they don't agree with. I just, I, and this is more of a uh, overall approach, I'm not, not specific at this council, but you don't need to spend a lot of money. If you simply say that, you know, we want to do some art piece, you people will come out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. And that's, then it becomes genuine as opposed to forced. Thank you, Councillor Loudon. But just on that, um... Most of these initiatives that you've um, commented on invest in people and, and um, initiatives rather than sort of hard infrastructure stuff. But my question, um, perpetual debt, you know, I actually um, enjoyed reading your submission <laughs> around that, um, and I tend to agree, but what do you think would be a prudent debt level um, for this council based on our rate program with that money? I need a lot more information to actually give you a concrete number. Uh, however, um, uh, I did some math. Apparently, debt uh, your debt interest payments currently as a percentage of rates five percent. I wouldn't want it to get further than that. I hold the view at the moment that we're actually staring down quite bad economic times going into the future. That's my prediction. So the less debt you have, the better. Um, I think it's probably. As opposed to looking at it as a what's the top debt you should have, I think that the the focus should be more on before you borrow the money, having a plan to pay it off. And I mean, there's there's so many things you can do. I mean, I, I suggested to the Rotary Council getting someone like Spark to sponsor the pool. Call it the Spark, whatever, Aquatic Centre, whatever. No one cares about it. You don't, people won't refer to it as the Spark Aquatic Centre. You get some money for some advertising to cover the maintenance costs, sweet as no one cares. It's just finding alternatives as opposed to just constantly sort of everyone coming and just going, mm -hmm. which means you have to come to me and go. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your submission. Thank you. I'm always scared to, to go into AI to produce this. <laughs> it's not there yet. I'll say that. Yeah, Len, it's not there yet. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Move on to the submission of Sport Wanganui. Um, Thank you. Uh, Tanya, will you explain um, who's who? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So, kia ora koutou. Uh, ko Tanya King to Wharingwa. Um, I am Tanya King and I'm the CE at Sport Wanganui. This is Whitney Cox, who is our Insights and Evaluation Lead 
at Sport Whanganui as well. And um, we just appreciate the fact that we can come and speak to you on our submission about the um, mountain pool. So from our point of view, there are um, we believe that there is strong uh, <coughs> support to keep the pool open. Uh, firstly, from our health team, so we have an active wellbeing health team that operates out of Sport Whanganui and they have a number of clients in Martin who access the pool um, and their clients, uh, their health is compromised to a certain extent and so the pool allows them to exercise um, and it is one of the safest mm -hmm. forms of exercise for those who have compromised health mm -hmm. uh, and currently with it only being open for two terms of the year it leaves them little choice as to what they can do during the winter months. Uh, and this has been expressed through the insights to our health team as well. So there's, you know, a lot of support for the for the pool to be open throughout the those winter months. <coughs> uh, it's a not impacting in supportive activity, as you all know, uh, and there's little alternatives for them. The other insights that we've gathered is through the schools. So we have... Uh, a number of uh, relationships and uh, our staff are working in a number of the primary schools and in the secondary school here. And the schools have expressed that they can access the pool, but because there's a number of them that don't have their own pools, that uh, they <coughs> struggle to get bookings in the pool. Uh, and it's only usually during, obviously, term one and two. However, schools don't really ramp up into those bookings until a couple of weeks into the start of the term. So it's quite <coughs> as to the access for that first term. And at the end of the year as well, uh, they are limited at the end of the year because they're rolling into Christmas and the shutdown period. If it was open during throughout the year, they've indicated that they would make use of it. And as we know, it's really important um, that students learn to swim. You know, it is, it, it is essential. Currently, we know that there's a number of schools that are coming either over to Wanganui to the Splash Centre or over to the Marquino in Fielding so that they can take their kids to uh, swimming during the winter months. Uh, we also know that uh, the, the, the social return on the investment. So we acknowledge that to keep the pool open, that there is a financial cost to ratepayers. However, um, in most cases, pool facilities are not financial investments. And we realise or know through research, which has been conducted by Sport NZ, that for every dollar invested, there is a $2.12 return on social investment. So that's to do with the wellbeing in your community uh, and the impact on them. So there is a huge amount of return socially rather than financially. So that is... Um, of a significant importance. Uh, the other thing that we want to acknowledge is that we have developed a very strong working relationship with the Rangatukei District Council, uh, and we really appreciate that. We have a staff member that is now in Martin, um, and Libby works very closely with a number of the schools, and that is where we can help uh, help the council to develop plans to activate the pool during those winter months and support that. Um, and we're more than happy to do that uh, because of the contacts that we have. But uh, again, it's something that we are quite uh, keen to do. So if the decision is made to extend the pool hours, we'd welcome the opportunity to work alongside council staff <coughs> to help activate the pool. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Councillor Wilson. Um, thank you. And I know that there will be lots of questions, so I'll try and be brief. Sure. Your, your comment about the uh, increased physical activity and for every dollar spent, mm -hmm. that is an activity in general, not specifically an activity related to swimming. Would that be correct? To sport activities. That is sport activity yeah. across yeah. the board. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Lambert. Now, you sort of sent me answered my question. Like you, you'd say you'd get involved with helping set it up, but what would you see your long term involvement as in get, getting people to the pool? Um, yeah, so we can assist with obviously uh, advocating that the pool's open. We, like I say, we work in a number of schools here, and that's through our um, healthy active learning program that we do have. We can help push out any uh, marketing of the pool uh, in our region and 
you know, the fact that it is a heated covered pool is quite significant. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can speak to that. Uh, we, we also manage an uh, activation fund um, on behalf of Sport New Zealand. And if there were some ideas maybe coming from the pool about programs they could run, um, equipment that they might need to make it more attractive um, to Tamariki and Nangatahi, we could look at um, a Tamarawa application to fund some of that. We administer the fund on behalf of Sport NZ. We get 366000 a year. I've got questions from Councillor um, Dalgiri Wilson to um, and Pikatiora and myself to Councillor Loudon if we have time. Can, please make your questions and answers right on point. Councillor. Um, can you please tell me who are the bigger, biggest users of whoops, Wanganui Splash Centre over winter? I would say the schools, but I couldn't answer that question because we don't operate the Splash Centre. Answer. Uh, that answer probably negates my question. I was about to ask information on the on the space mm -hmm. centre, so I won't. Okay. Oh, uh, Tani, thank yeah. you for your submission. Um, I'm interested to know um, this uh, this key choice at the moment is talking about Martin Pool, mm -hmm. and so I just uh, thank you for the what you've put in around that. Given that there's Huntable and Taihapu mm -hmm. as well, that, that uh, council um, uh, council properties. How does um, the work that you're doing there, how would you translate that over if, this, if next if our next LTP there was going to be something for Huntable, for instance? In a similar way, because we do advocate for facilities, obviously, to be open for the public and, again, to support the use of those activities and for them to come, or for the community, to have them available. And we work, so we have work across three regions, so Ruapehu, Wanganui and obviously here as well um, and particularly for the health clients and the schools it would be very similar Thank you I'll carry on with the questions first on rotation if you're signalling our second question um, There have been a number of submissions based around um, the user pay position if we were to increase substantially um, the money that should be paid by the users do you have a view on that? I have a view on that. Um, that obviously it is a user pays. However, within if it was schools that are taking their students there, that wouldn't be reflected on the students. It would have to be covered by the schools. Having a background in education through the ops grants, they are unable to do that. They can't put that on charge onto the school, onto the students, sorry. The schools would have to pay that. Um, but like Whitney uh, outlined, we have a number of applications that come through on the Tamanawa funding to help these students mm -hmm. get access to the pools. Thank you. Councillor Loud and Councillor Duncan run really cool clips there, I'm sorry. Um, you may not be able to answer this question, but um, to what extent does Wanganui and the Council contribute to their pools? Um, do you understand how, what, they, what the attitude is and... So, they, so historically, Sport Wanganui did manage the Splash Centre until about three years ago. Um, and at that point, it was an open book. And so during that time, I, there was, over and above the management fee, there was a significant amount that the council had to put in. But I would... I couldn't put a percentage on it, just thinking off the top of my head. They fully run that now, and um, the cost is by, you know, through user pays, obviously. Um, I don't think, I think it's $4.50, and they've just recently uh, reviewing the price on, on that. Your close <laughs> question, Councillor Duncan. Uh, thank you, Tanya and Whitney. Um, I just, uh, my question is, would you support um, the idea of us trialling this for a year, or would you say that we'd have to get all in for, for the three years? Uh, I would suggest for a year, but I think it would also be wise. Similar to what's in Wanganui, and they, they're considering the, the Wanganui East pool, but it would be worthwhile getting a feasibility study. Ideally, keeping it open while that was happening mm -hmm. would be, or even for a year, to see 
what um, was... As part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I also think it also comes down to the marketing as well. So making yeah. it very well aware yeah. that it is open now throughout the, throughout the year will make a significant di difference. Thank you. Thank you. I need to call it. That's there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and the last submission within this group before lunch, um, we have John, John Bly. John. Sorry to hold up your lunch, people. <laughs> Fine, but thank you for the consideration. <laughs> Before we start on talking on my submission, I'd like you to have a minute silent for George Luke, please. And for what reason? Out of respect that you've already shown to the family. I, I don't mind it being part of my 10 minutes. Sorry, to, to whose family? I didn't hear the first part. And, pardon? I didn't hear the first part of what you said as you took what you wanted the minute silence for. For well, George Luke? I believe you know who he is, Mr. Yes, Mayor. Could we have a minute silent for him, please? And part of your submission session. It's part of my submission time. I'm fine. Yeah. Thank you in the memory of George's family. Now you're probably going to wonder who George was. So I have some paperwork I need to distribute to. I do not wish you to read it. I'll give it to you downside up and you will be doing part of my submission by reading it later. <coughs> the mayor and the deputy mayor do not need a copy. Thank you. Thank you. If you're distributing it, the information that needs to go to everyone. You already are aware of this information. Yes, but, okay. but whatever is tabled has to go to everybody. If there's enough copies. That's part of the process. Mm -hmm. And there's another public document I will share to you. You can look at this one now, but I prefer if you let the other one downside up, and I'm going to give you time okay. to think on the submission. The submission is that... A full independent review of civil defence be carried out. Now, I've arrived at this decision by investigations through councillors and the mayor to come to the understanding that it cannot be fixed in house. I've tried through elected members to get a a more effective civil defence plan going. Uh, and that has fallen on deaf ears. Now, it needs to be done by an independent person for those very reasons. But let's get on board and instead of uh, calling it Operation Hindsight, why don't we get one step ahead and call it Operation Foresight so you are ahead of the game, not like saying, oh, we should have done that after the event. <coughs> now, in the past, I come up with this idea that we should ship the Civil Defence Centre in Bulls from Clifton School, where it had been for more than 20 years. So I rung a council officer with this idea to see if it would float. To which he replied, it already is. 
in the new town hall and balls. I said, well, that's strange, because I've just passed two signs pointing towards Clifton School, telling it's the Civil Defence Centre. Uh, to which the reply was, and it's written in that letter from the MP from Rangitiki, which was my last resort to try and get some traction on this, but the people of Bulls do not know, in general, that it has shifted from Clifton School to the new town hall, which he assured me that it would happen, that people would know. Well, I'm part of those people, and I certainly didn't know that it had shifted from Clifton School to the new town hall. But the signs are still indicating. And he come back with the comment, I've been taking those signs down and someone keeps putting them back up. You might find that ludicrous. Well, I thought it was too. But anyway, we're giving the benefit of the doubt that some person with a ready-made supply of civil defence centre signs follows him around and puts them back up. I'll let you work out that. But anyway, in the meantime, the signs have come down, but it took seven months for the two signs to come down. And the people of Bulls have still, and the Southern Rank Ticket, have still not been told that it has shifted from Clifton School to the new town hall. Okay, I can live with that a bit. But then a new sign appears on the new town hall and bulls, calling it a civil defence centre. If you read the letter from the MP from Rangitiki, the building is not up to standard to be a civil defence centre and should not have that sticker on it. And when I left bulls this morning, the Civil Defence Centre sign is still up in Bulls, and there's one opposite the Memorial Hall in Martin, which also states there it cannot be a Civil Defence Centre. So what is going on behind the scenes in Civil Defence, I will ask. I have no idea, other than the fact it is out of control. Now, to divert funding to a Civil Defence report, independent report, there was one done on the Auckland Council by Mike Bush, who is generally the accepted guru now in reports on uh, civil emergencies aftermath. And it was 100 grand. I think that's well worth spending now to get one step ahead of the game, get that report done and act on it. You're about to spend two million on a building for civil defence. But it's not a civil defence centre, is my understanding. It will be a civil defence headquarters. Is that uh, correct? Now, if you, I will ask you to turn over the document that I ask you not to look at. You've got one and a half minutes left. Well, I'll have to read fast then. <laughs> it's very disturbing reading anyway. That's what brought me here in the memory of George Luke. <coughs> he died unnecessary in this district. Um, I'll stop you there, John. I'm sorry. This is a, an action that is in front of the police. I'll instruct the process to stop. We have no, no jurisdiction. I'm not expressing an opinion on it. That is a public document. It's a public document, but it is under police investigation, so I will stop you there. Well, it's sobering reading. Any questions, please? One minute, Councillor Councilor Duncan. Oh, I have a hearing impediment. Could you please? Yes. I can come closer to you. No, stay there. She'll speak up. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Bly. I uh, just, I would like to know. So, you're requesting council to do a civil defence study? No, I'm asking you to do an independent report. Okay. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Loudon, the okay. last question. Thank you. I was just curious about your um, respects trophy thing. Can I deliver it to Councillor Loudon? Because I'm too emotional to actually read what it says on here. Well, that's fine. <laughs> Mm. 
Thank you, Councillor. Is this in relation to um... my my history in civil defence and where we were involved in the two hundred four floods? That's fine. Mm -hmm. What's written on here? It's an ANZ um, Urban Community Member Award. It's proudly presented to Alison Bly for significant contribution to the recovery and relief efforts involved following the February two thousand four flood. Right. And. Thank you. Thank you for your submission. That is a picture of George Luke. Um, we need to stop there, please. Councillors, we will now adjourn for lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Till one o'clock. Uh, for those online, we will reconvene one o'clock. Oh, wow. Thank you very much.